share my screen. So I'll make it big. Now, now you guys are going to have to remember when I'm doing a shared screen, I may not always, um, because I tend to hide some of these panels that are popping up, I will not know if you're nodding your heads. So if you'll make sure that you say yes or no or something like that, that's uh, very helpful for me. And then um, if you have any questions, feel free. I'm going to let Destiny uh, definitely help um, rename or, or moderate this. Just let me know if anybody has questions. So feel free to ask those anytime during the course of this. I have no problem with that. Okay. So my name is Isabella, and I don't even go by my last name, so I'm not even going to tell you that. So if you decide to write me, uh, just make sure it's Isabella, Bella, or Isa. They're all fine. There's an A on the end of them. And uh, Johnston, though, is my last name, but don't ever call me by my last name because I'll go, well, I don't know. You know, we're on a very first name basis here within my company and everybody that um, I, I work with. So it's okay to call me by my first name. <clears throat> now, um, my background is in education. I used to be a public classroom teacher. I moved over and for 11 years, I taught in Seminole County middle and high school English. And then I moved over to teaching in higher ed. Um, I've not, I have not taught at Valencia, but I graduated from Rollins. So I've taught there, I've taught at Strayer, DeVry, some of those uh, schools a lot for the medical uh, industry, quite frankly, where it was you know, like radiology or nursing or those types of programs where I was teaching APA writing and entrepreneurship, marketing, organizational development, those types of courses is what I taught. Um, at the same time, one of the great things about being in education is Nobody thinks twice when you have another side gig. So they're very accommodating. Um, I've been writing business plans for businesses. I have pivot business consulting. Um, from there, a lot of my, my peers and some of my customers were saying, hey, how do you get so many students to come and work with you? And I had told them it's because I have a blended background. It's in that space of HR, specifically training and learning. And then also in education, my MBA came from Bellhaven University, and I'm all but dissertation for a PhD in leadership with a specialization in training and learning, uh, human resource development. So um, obviously, I'm deeply embedded into education, and that's one of the things that I have never gotten tired of doing is I love being able to teach, I like writing, I like research. So the first thing I would say is you wanna make sure that you know yourself and you know what your gifts are. So today we're supposed to be talking about um, internships and it can be internships with Intern Pursuit, but it can also be through my platform. And as I said earlier, um, I had a lot of business people coming to me and saying, hey, how do you do this so well? So I started teaching them and that's how I could see that there was an opportunity to get into the market. And then, you know, it was one of those questions that one of my friends asked, could I scale it? And what that means is, you know, take me out of it. If I had a thousand employers and a thousand students come in and say, hey, we want, you know, internships, could I, could I do that? Could I match them? And I said, no way. Um, they said, solve the problem. So that's what I went on this journey in life to do is to create a platform that would standardize an intern program that would make it really good for the student. I'm very passionate about the side of the student for sure. But I also wanted to help employers do a better job of creating a good intern program. So I'm gonna educate you hopefully and the things that will matter to you when you're looking for an internship as well as talk to you about what my platform does. So it's two for one here. And I'm gonna speak with you guys again on another date in two weeks. So we're gonna talk about something totally different. We're gonna talk about LinkedIn and, and what you should uh, be having on that resume. So this is Kim, she's a student. She's looking for an internship. 
And she wants it to be with a really good employer. Uh, she wants to be able to learn, get some skills, but she doesn't you know, know exactly where to start. She needs to know some vital information. And so first thing is many students are always looking for the paid internships. They're, they're kind of like a, a unicorn that's dressed like a horse, if you will. Um, there's a lot of internships that are out there, but they're not all paid. And last year, COVID, COVID took a real hit on this and it made it so that they were virtually impossible to find. And that included even with the top tier companies. So 70% of the internships in the United States are unpaid. Now, when we were doing some customers discovery with students, we wanted to know, if, you know what did students want from an internship? And, and I always figured it was gonna be that they wanted to have real skills. Um, but what's even more important, employers don't know that when you take it as a four credit class, you're doing this, it counts as an elective and you're paying for it. And then you may not be getting paid to be in that internship. So you really, really wanna make sure that you're getting real skills on the resume and you're getting mentoring in the, in the field of study that you are going to school for. So this is what you need to know when you're looking in the workplace. Um, employers, they know that internships are short term. So it takes three months of being able to train people to do their job. So that's a lot of their hesitation as to why they don't always want to be able to pay a student for that because they know that they're going to be doing some training. But not all employers do it that way. So some employers will have you do, you know, the really crummy work that you don't want to do or they don't want to do. And if it's not tied to your what you're going to school for, your major, then that's a problem. I'm gonna tell you about the seven criteria that you need to know in an unpaid internship so that when you recruit, or I'm sorry, when you interview, you go to um, really good places. So you wanna be prepared and you wanna make sure that you have a resume. So this is gonna be a question that I'm gonna ask everybody. Should you put your picture on your resume? How many say yes? How many say no? You can just put that in the chat and then Destiny, you can tell me what they say. Um, just real quick, we'll see because there's uh, some things that I'm gonna tell you about getting prepared for your internship. How many said yes, they would put a picture on there? Anybody? I'm getting a lot of no's. That is good. That's what I want to hear. You do not wanna put your picture on there. Anybody know why? Shout it out if you want. Or you can jot uh, it in. Some, somebody's saying uh, bias. Yes. yes, that is the biggest reason. That is one way that an employer can discriminate against you. They could look at your name and go, what is this name? I don't even know how to say this name, Johnston. What is that? I don't even know. Is that even you know somebody from the United States? I have no idea. So they could say no because they see your name because they you put a picture on there. There's a lot of ways that people can you know discriminate, and that is not what you want to see happen. So do not put your um, certainly do not put your picture on there. But you also want to proofread your resume. Um, I've had people put on their resume. Um, no email address and no phone number. And I'm going, how am I supposed to get in touch with you? I have no idea. So make sure that your phone number is correct. Read it out loud. Think about it. Read slowly. I've had, you know, numbers that are typed in correctly. You know, they transpose the numbers. The email address may not be a email address that they actually go to. So if you don't go to your school email address, do not put that on there. Go to include an email address that you use a lot. And if you can, make sure that you have um, really good skills on there. We'll talk about what that looks like too. So you also wanna make sure that you do your research on the company. Make sure that you sit down and you know something. If you're coming to me, most students do not know anything about my company no matter which of my companies, and I have five that they can come to me through. 
if they don't know anything about my company, I'm going, well, why are you looking at it? Do you know anything about me? Do you know anything about my company? What do you know about the job? So do your research, look at their social feeds, go check them out on LinkedIn, see what people, what you know, type of uh, recommendations that the person has. You, know, you need to know who you're talking with as well as information about that company. Make sure it's somebody that you would want to work with. Um, be ready because now everybody's still interviewing via Zoom. So you want to think about your background, make sure that you have your dress professionally. I've had students come to interviews that they, they weren't ready. They weren't even dressed professionally and they had their cameras off. You want to be able to connect with people because this is, you know, we're relational as humans and we want to be able to, um, get to know each other. So you wanna have your camera on, you wanna make sure that you're looking camera ready and that you know, you've know you got a dog next to you, but your dog is gonna be quiet because you are at home. We know those things, but you know, think about those things. The next thing is you wanna make sure that it's quiet around you. So you can probably tell, and when you're looking at me, if you are clicked on my picture, I am at an office. This is one of the four places that I work out of and it's called Starter Studio. This is a garage door that's behind me and it actually opens up into a bigger conference room. But people don't have to come and work with me on site. As a matter of fact, you don't. most of my team never comes and works with me on site, very few. Um, a couple of them maybe if they want to, but I tell them, okay, you're sitting way over there on the other side of the room and we have masks and we have all of these things but you know inside of this room um, there's five people literally five people that come into a building that held 200 people so you don't always have a lot of people around you it's easy to be that six feet apart and um, be able to do that but you want to ask if that employer is providing a remote opportunity for you and if so you want to think about how you're even dressed on those calls when you're having a you know a team call or an office call with your your boss and then you want to make sure that you don't have things going on around you uh, there's a train that runs right next to this building so i usually move away from the windows where i normally sit so you guys don't hear the train you also want to think about some questions that you might want to ask um, remember this is a two-way process it's a lot like dating and you want to think about, well, what do you know about me? Come in and ask questions. What do you want to know about this position? You know, ask a lot of those questions because I can tell you how many hours you might be with me or with any of our employers. I can tell you if it's remote. I can tell you if it's paid or unpaid. I can tell you a lot of those things that are usually top of the mind, but you should, if you've done your research, you should come in with some of those who, what, why, where, when, how, type questions like, what would it be like to intern at your business? If you've looked at any of the social feeds, you'll read some what I learned stories. You'll see that there's uh, recommendations from students as well as employers that are our partners. You'll testimonials. You'll, you'll see a lot of information and that will help either give you an idea of a question that you might wanna ask or it's going to give you insight into something that is not a typical question. So you might even come and say, well, why do you have five companies? Like, that seems crazy. And I would tell you why. Um, the last one, remember, this is a two-way two street. Like I said, you want to think through what this conversation is going to be. You don't want it to just take an internship just because somebody's offering it to you. You want to know, well, you know, what what technology platforms would I use? Um, what type of certificates could I possibly earn? Will there be a technical mentor for me as well as a, a uh, you know, uh, just somebody that's going to make sure that I'm going to be successful? You know, ask those kind of questions. So think through that, be prepared. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this organization. It's the National Association of College of of colleges and employers. And it is one of the biggest organizations that schools, colleges, universities participate with. And they are there to help make sure that um, 
students and schools do a good job of preparing students for the future, specifically for the future of work. Uh, and just let me make sure I pause after every couple of slides. Does anybody have any questions so far? Feel free to let me know. If the answer is no, I'll, I'll continue. Everybody good? Okay, then I'm going with yes. Oh, somebody came into the room here. Um, all right, let me hide that one. So it's called NACE. And so NACE is, let me get rid of that thing that's giving me a problem. Ooh, because I seem to have lost control of my, my deck. There we go. Okay, I've got it. So these are um, key skills, and there's a difference between a task that you do in a company, the tasks, the responsibilities versus the skills. These are skills that you guys want to make sure that you're developing in the job. So critical thinking, problem solving, those are really, really valuable because skills are things that you can take across an industry, whether you're working in a nonprofit and you're moving over to technology company, those are industries. You want to be able to make that transition easily. You want to have examples that demonstrate that you have uh, used critical thinking with an employer. And if you can take as many internships as you possibly can, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Take one every single semester. If you decide that you want to stay with an employer, I've, I've had seven students stay with me for like three semesters, essentially a year, because they worked in different roles, whether it was like marketing or specifically social content or over there in HR, they wanted to try on different positions so they could see what they were really excited about. So that can be a good move too. But you also want to be able to create some leadership opportunities for yourself. So anybody that comes in and tells me that they're going to take something off of my shoulders, they're standing out as a leader, they're standing out as somebody that's going to come and solve problems for me. And I'm going, oh, you just went from being average to the top of the list. So think about those things when you're asking questions of, of, of people that you want to potentially work with. Communications and professionalism. These are, again, the skills that people are looking for. So communications, um, a little quick quiz here. Does it include um, these, all of these things, or only three of these things? Um, is it communication, does it include listening skills, written skills, verbal skills, body language? So is it three of those things or all four of those things on communications? A little quick answer in that chat so Destiny can tell me what you guys think. So they're saying yes and all. Oh, I like that. Yes, it is all of them. Because if you're on a Zoom call, then you can see the body language of the person, right? You can tell if they're like looking at their phone the whole time. It, it is so obvious when people are on phones when we're doing video calls because we are forced to sit in a chair and look directly at a screen to have eye contact. And that is one of the things that's very unique about this and part of why it's so exhausting to work remotely, I think, this is my opinion. Because if I'm in a room with people, I can look over to the side, I can talk with them, I can look across the room, I can actually sit and take notes and nobody's gonna be thinking, well, what are you doing? So it's not a distraction. So communication is one of the most important skills, um, being able to be a good listener and ask thoughtful questions um, really demonstrates that you're engaging and you're thinking through and you're not afraid to ask questions. So be brave, ask lots of questions, that's a good thing. And professionalism that comes across with how prepared you are when you show up on time for your meetings, when you come dressed like you're in the office. And then you are also um, not like slouched on your bed. These are all things that when we're doing remote, it can happen. And I have been known to kick people out of meetings when they turn around and start having a conversation with their, their parent for the third time. I'm going, okay, that's it. 
you know that this is a business meeting. You need to put yourself in a place where you're not going to have distractions because this is our once a week or twice a week team meeting. So, you know, figure out how you're going to solve the problem. But I will kick them out for that reason because it's not professional. If you were sitting in the office with me, you would not turn around and start talking with somebody because that's just not how it's not showing respect. It's not being professional to what the purpose is of the meeting. Teamwork, career management, obviously you guys understand teamwork. I always look for those that um, enjoy working in with a partner because I will pair people up inside of my company. And that's one of the things that I encourage um, employers to do as a part of the interim pursuit platform is make sure that they meet, work with different people on the team, make sure that they get to have somebody else to work with. So they're bouncing ideas past them. But when we get to career management, you need to find an internship that's in the degree, not the degree, but the actual major that you're going to school for. So if you're going to school for video production and you're being asked to work on a website, that's not the same. That you might be producing a video that would be going in on a YouTube channel or going on the website, but you should not be you know, creating the website, building a website, because that's not what you're going to school for, even if you already have experience for that. And if you are doing something that's not exactly on point with what you're going to school for, 80% of what you're doing in that job description should be related to your major and the other 20% can be whatever else is, you know, of your interest. So if working on a website is part of the role of a video production, and maybe it's because there's like videos on every single page, you know, that would make sense. You know, how, what is the file type? What is the size that you have to put up there on that um, website? And how would you even work with SEO for that? There's like things you can think through so that you can have multiple skills and it's helping you to create more value when you're looking at what your career is going to be. These last two are technology. So I'm um, just kind of curious, what is uh, your definition of technology? Please go ahead and type your answer in there. I'm gonna jump over to Global Fluency while you guys are doing that. Global Fluency, it's a small world and we're very diverse and you probably are seeing that by the names of the people that are here as well as those that are turning their cameras on and, and showing their, their face, if you will. That is part of, um, you know, I only speak one language and I barely speak Spanish, you know, barely. So people that can speak two languages, three multiple languages, that's huge. So speaking the language is one part of it, but also being able to understand the culture because maybe they're a first generation American graduating from Valencia College, but, you know, there's a lot of culture that comes from being from another part of the world. Florida is, and it's specifically Orlando, is very, very um, diverse. We see so many people that come through here, even with COVID. So it's important to have an openness to hearing other people um, where they're from, listening to their, their ways of how things are done somewhere else, and being open to um, you know, working as a team to, to, to produce something that's going to be a value. So what are some of those definitions of technology? So I have computer skills, Zoom, new skills with computer technology is advanced tools and improving processes. Those um, are all really good. What else? I have uh, technology is the use of tools that create change that makes life more easier for people and we'll keep advancing in effectiveness with time. Oh, that sounds very good. That sounds like they may have gone and Googled it. That's even <laughs> better. So I like the, uh, the depth and the breadth of those various definitions of how you interpret it. When you're thinking about technology, it includes the platforms that you are learning for the job. You're right, Zoom is one of those platforms that we use in the workplace. So. It is inclusive of if you're in computer science and maybe you're the programmer, but it is all people because I use Google Drive, I use PowerPoint to create this, this deck that I'm sharing with you. 
I use Canva to create my images that are up here. There's all types of technology that you're using to produce something. So it could be Microsoft Teams. It could be that you use Google products, the Google Suite. It could be that you use Zoom. You could use Skype. Again, just think about all of these things that you use because that would be something you would want to put on your resume because that's gonna to translate to an employer that you know how to use some industry specific um, skills or, or industry specific platforms. So that would be good to have on there. All of these things are going to be something that you might wanna have on your resume and put some type of a level of uh, a proficiency on a scale of one to five. Where are you on leadership? Are you a four? Remember, use those five sparingly because it's saying that you're an expert at where you are in your life at this point, but you can always learn more. So these are just some examples, but they are not the only examples. It can be time management. It can be creativity. It can also be um, problem solving. It can be just so many places. And there's some really good um, resources that I'll tell you about on um, the next time I speak with you on where you can identify some skills that will help you to stand out on your resume. Any questions so far? I actually have a question when it comes to technology. Um, I've previously had experience working with Access mm -hmm. and I've been to a few different companies and I've act, asked the question, hey, since it is kind of one of those more outdated programs that isn't used too often, should you still put it on a resume of you know how to use it? And they've told me no. Would you recommend still including it? I think, it, well, it depends on the size of the company. Small companies generally don't use it. Access was um, a table builder, I believe. Mm -hmm. I've only used it once. So it, it was, I guess, the closest thing I could you know, align it with is something that would be like Excel. But if you're going for a really big company and you would want to go and look up on their website or on their job description, see if um, that is something that they're using, I would definitely put it on there. But, you know, it can also be something that you could include underneath a Microsoft suite because that includes obviously Word, you know, Excel, Access, as well as PowerPoint. You know, then you're pretty much covered. You don't have to call it out, but I'm going to guess you're very skilled with Microsoft Suite. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. And that's just like one question. So it's, you just need to make sure that you're, you're doing your research again on what that opportunity can be. Um, I think it was smart that you also asked a question of other people to see what they would say. And you know, I usually do those same kind of polls myself. I'll go and ask anywhere from like five to 10 people, like 10. And I don't ask my friends. I ask people that I, you know, will not know very well. And I know they're going to tell me not what I want to hear. They're going to tell me truly their opinion and or what they, they think is not what I, again, what I want to hear, but what I need to hear. And if I ask a question and say, you know, hey, what do you think about this logo? You know, if I was a graphic designer, what do you think about this? What do you like about it? What do you don't like about it? Well, if I ask 10 people and, you know, eight out of 10 are telling me there's a problem with this one color, then I need to pay attention to it and go make a change to it because it's not gonna, it's not gonna resonate well. And if I give my resume to other people, like if, um, I get resumes from people that are not from the United States and they'll usually put a picture up there. Some of them will put their date of birth. Some of them will go and put, um, gosh, some other things like their address, their mailing address. And I'm going, you don't need those things up there, especially here in the United States. We would never put our, our you know, birth date on there because First off, that's a for sure way you're going to get discriminated against if you're, um, you know, over 40. Over 40 is a protected class, and if you are putting that on there, you know, that's also some of that identity theft. So think really carefully about what information is supposed to be there. But people don't use addresses anymore, and this is a surprising fact: is that um, when you put an address, people can tell based on the zip code what, what. Um, 
what area of town it would be. And if it's something that's really affluent, that's great. But if it's an area of town that you don't want to be associated with, don't put it on there. But that's also used for doing credit scoring. So uh, when you're filling out applications, your zip code matters quite a bit. But it can be a way that people will go, oh, I know that area of town. Never mind. I don't want to work with it. So just keep it to your email address and make sure it's something that not with your birth date in it, not like Sue Miller, 1990. You know, you don't want to do that. You know, make sure that it it's Sue Miller, it's Sue Dot Miller, whatever, that you're going to put something really simple, um, not, you know, yoga mom, anything like that. I've seen people say that too. So that's why I'm putting those out there. So finding the perfect internship is like dating. You have to think of it that way. So, you know, you want to show interest in that person. They should be showing interest in you. They should ask questions of you. You're asking questions of them. You know, you all have the same goal. You want to be able to see if we're really going to be matched. And that's what my platform is there to do. Internpursuit.tech is the platform. It works like match.com. We eliminate the bias. So now people don't get to look at your resume anymore. You're completing an application that's on our website. The employer has it. We match based on um, key skills, like what I was showing you over there earlier with NACE. We match based on preferences, like I want to work remotely. I want to be able to have flexible hours. I'm a junior in college, you know, these types of preferences. And then we match based on culture fit. So that way we're finding a really good way to um, put human to human. Instead of you applying to a job description, I'm, we're actually matching you up to another human. So that it would be somebody that would be a technical mentor or a success mentor in this case. Excuse me, Isabella, we actually have a, a question. Yeah. It says, uh, is there um, internships for over 40 people? Oh yeah, I've had lots of people work with me and also with our employers. So they should absolutely, as a matter of fact, I have somebody that's a veteran. She's been 21 years in the military. She is working with me um, and she's got huge skills, so much deep experience. That's very, very valuable on um, that space of operations. I've had plenty of people over 40 work with me, even in their 60s. So that is a plus, that should not be a problem. Any other questions? Uh, not that I'm seeing. Cool. All right. So there are seven criteria that you need to consider for unpaid internships. And remember, we're talking about unpaid internships. And I told you there's 70% of them in the country, right? So there's seven, seven criteria. And this is according to the Department of Labor. That's what DOL means that you need to be aware of. And there's a test for it. And so this is straight from their website. The court uses what's called a primary beneficiary test to determine whether an intern or a student is in fact an employee under the Florida, it's Florida, oh, just a minute. I can't think of it, it'll come to me in a minute. I'm gonna keep going on. Um, Florida Labor Standards Act, that's it. Okay, so in short, this test allows the courts to examine the economic reality of whether the intern employer relationship is there to determine who the primary beneficiary is, meaning, is it you or is it the employer? So we built our, our platform around these seven criteria, which is there to protect the student. So when the student is protected and you know the employer is making sure that the student is the beneficiary, then it's gonna be completely compliant with the Department of Labor standards. So the first one is the extent to which the intern and the employer clearly understand that there's no expectation of compensation. So they cannot promise that there's going to be any compensation. They, they can buy you lunch, they can give you stipends, they can give you all of those types of things, but you're not coming in going, okay, I know I'm going to get paid, or they're not saying, well, we'll see at the end of the internship, maybe we'll hire you. They shouldn't say that. They shouldn't say that at all. And it suggests that the intern is an employee or vice versa. So no promise of being paid. The second one is the extent to which the internship provides training 
that would be similar, similar to that which would be given in an educational environment, including clinical and other hands-on training provided by educational institutions. So what that means is when you go in there, you're supposed to be doing things that are specific. Destiny, what's your uh, major? Uh, business and organizational leadership. Okay, so she's got two parts. So because she's business, that's pretty broad. She could be coming in under processes and helping to create some processes and some um, some other things that would be needing. It could be because she's organizational leadership, she could be helping to create some training processes. That's a blended approach. She could be learning about marketing. She could be learning about accounting. All of those are really valuable because that's what falls under the umbrella of business. So she needs to have also some hands-on training. So if it's marketing, she might be learning how to create social content. That's the most common thing that happens for a student that is stu studying marketing, but there's more to it than just that. It could be press releases, it could be creating buyer personas, it could be understanding analytics and SEO, and it could be about writing, being the one that creates the infographs or the um, white papers. There's a lot of things that go all the way across in marketing, business development. So you're there to learn something and it's related to your major. And when it's more broad like Destiny's is in business, it means that she has a lot of options. But if you come in and you're a graphic designer, then it's gonna be very specific. You're not there to create social content. Remember that's the 20% window. You're there to do 80% of what you're doing is graphics. It can be for print, it can be for the website, it could be for social channels, but you're not there just to create all of the posts and write articles. That's not what you're going to school to study. The third one is the extent to which the internship is tied to the intern's formal education program by integrated coursework or the receipt of academic credit. So you can do it for credit. You can also do it for no credit. That's totally okay, as long as it's tied to your major. That's the important thing to remember. So if you're organizational development or, or leadership, it should be focused on anything that's usually in that communications. There's even a place where um, I'm in that space of OD, organizational development, that marketing and um, uh, training and learning, they're merging together because it's about the employee experience. The employee experience and happiness matters because that is, uh, the face of who your customers are working with. So you want happy employees. That means that there should be more returning customers staying in the, the sales wheel, if you will, so that you know the company does well. So it has to be tied to what you're studying in school. The fourth one is the extent to which the internship accommodates the intern's academic commitments by corresponding to the school's academic calendar. You could do an internship, it could be January to April. Um, that's usually about three months, three to four months, but you could also, if you're doing it for no credit, you can drop into it any time and place of a, of a year, but it still needs to be tied to about like three to four months, just so you guys know. And it's really important that you stay in place for like three to four months, even if you're not doing it for school credit, because you want to have some longevity and you want to get as much out of that internship experience as possible so that you can have more skills as well as some responsibilities and tasks on your resume. Any questions so far? That's supposed to be a calendar. Gonna go no. Fifth one. The extent to which the internship's duration is limited to the period in which the internship provides the intern with beneficial learning. Again, it's still saying, you know, it's an academic year. It's going to be, you know, could be spring, summer, or fall. It can be anywhere in that time frame, tied to about three to four months. So again, you want to be thinking about that. It's not that you're going in there for a whole year. That might be more like a, an apprenticeship. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it needs to still be tied to your um, major, for sure. And you're getting experience that is related to you getting a job somewhere. The sixth one is the extent to which the intern 
Interns work complements rather than, than displaces the work of paid employees while providing significant educational benefits to the intern. So this thing right here, significant educational benefits, you, you've got to be learning and growing for sure. And you can be working with somebody. So if it's a bookkeeper um, and you're there to learn bookkeeping, you want to work with somebody that does bookkeeping so that you'll understand journal entries and you'll understand you know how the credits and debits work and what are those financial statements that you do and how is accounting done differently for a nonprofit if that's where you're working versus a for-profit like those are the things that you want to think about so you're learning as well as you're working with that person but if they're going to have you in there and you're the bookkeeper and they don't want to hire a bookkeeper that's wrong you've got to have somebody that is that person that's mentoring you along the way. The last one is the extent to which the intern and the employer understand that the internship is conducted without entitlement to a paid job at the conclusion of the internship. So remember, it started with that you're not entitled to pay. When you finish your internship, you are not entitled to a paid job there's just none of that there, but what you should be leaving with are the real skills that will help you to get to that next place so you can get a job. So our platform, the reason why I created it is so that it would be compliant with the Department of Labor's criteria because there's so many people that are in unpaid internships that it aligns with NACE, those skills of the future skill-based, 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 and that there's real mentoring in there for you guys. This is what our platform looks like. And, you know, there's a place over here where students can apply and employers apply. We have 55 employees that want to work with students. We've been matching them up. Um, we have, you know, more openings. Some of them are in the game industry. Some of them are programming. All of those programming ones have already been matched up. Um, some of them are in the real estate industry. Some of them are in HR. Some of them, there's just different places. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. If your video or your graphic design or your um, marketing, those will always be snatched up pretty quickly. If you're in that space of programming, or games, game artists, or even in HR, it is a lot harder for you guys to be able to find a, a specific role in there. And it's because in programming, they want to know that you've got three years of, of experience. And how do you get that when you're trying to get you know, a job? You look for as many internships as you can possibly get, but you also have to work on your own projects. So there's all kinds of ways that you can supplement your education. You can use Coursera, Udemy. They have free courses, but they also have like 999 courses and they're like a gift that gives forever where you can learn about, you know, AI, artificial intelligence and Python and begin to build in that language. You can work and go to meetups and Eventbrite. And the things that I'm going to talk about in two weeks with you guys is all about these types of ways that you can network, that you can meet people, that you can look for other opportunities to get skills built on your resume. So it will help you to either get a really great internship. It can help you to be able to get an entry level job. Um, definitely a way for you to stand out. So that's where we are and there's my contact information. So that is the office number, that is my personal email address. But what I would tell you to do is go back here to the website. If you're looking for an internship, um, just click on that student supply and we will be in touch with you to get you matched up. Separate side note, I've been working with Berkeley University. They are one of the top five schools, number one schools in the United States for um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and computer science. They have worked with me on the first semester where I had a team of students and they created our algorithm 1.0. They're working with me this semester to take it up to 2.0 and uh, what they built a minimum viable product. These um, right now are Google Forms. So when you come in, it would be through a Google Form 
We're going to hand enter all of that in there and test out the algorithm to see if it actually is matching students to employers the way that I believe it will. So it's um, reducing bias um, and all of those good things. But we, in this one, not so much here uh, on this, I actually, let me just a minute, let me explain what I'm trying to do. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna go over to my, get out of my, here we go. I'm trying to get out of this. There we go, finally got out. Now, when you see how many tabs I have have open, do not judge me. There's probably like 60 up here. But we also have a learning academy for our students uh, and our employers. Let me share my screen one more time. There we go. So um, my, it's my shameless plug here, but we are um, working hard to make something that's scalable here. So there, there is a learning academy, and so we've got courses to help employers be really good mentors to manage students effectively and do a good job. Our topics are working with students with disabilities, working with veterans, um, working with individuals uh, with that are international students, any of those, those are the common things that we always encounter, but it also includes like a positive mindset and growth mindset and multi-generational communication. So there's gonna be ways that you guys uh, get to participate in those also. And the platform is not one that is uh, taking away from from the fact that you will get a job. So you could be the person that's the next mentor. So that's why it, it helps you to go all the way across. And I will tell you, the people that worked with me on this were Valencia College students. So they came from the graphic design program. The One of the programmers with me is a Valencia College student and he took Amazon Web Courses. He is working with the Berkeley team. He is my junior developer. And then I have students that have come from all different places, uh, but Valencia is one of my favorite schools to work with, and I do a lot with them. We have a podcast, and that's called The Intern Whisperer, and we talk about what the future of work looks like, um, and it's geared towards students as well as employers. You'll hear startup stories. You'll hear um, what does the future of work and jobs look like five years from now. This is our fourth season and we're on 10 podcast channels. We play in Ithaca, New York, as well as Valencia College Radio and Cornell University. So we are expanding our radio show. And then lastly, we have a game called Intern Pursuit Game. It's about students that are interns inside of our company. They um, go and through a portal and they fight aliens throughout the galaxy. It's a uh, Playable on Steam, and this has been something that you know we wanted to be able to help more of the game studios and the game students find each other. Uh, but if you want to play this and you send me an email, I will send you a game key so you can play it. And what I would ask is if you would just give us a review on Steam, that's helpful. But we have people that are playing this game, and then all the way down, our press is here. And then there's other things that you can look at to learn more about our company. But I will stop now and entertain any questions that you guys have. So I'm not sure how we're doing on time. How are we doing? Uh, we can go over a little bit. Um, they would like to have your uh, contact information again, if you can pull that up. Oh, sure. And I'll also put it here in the chat. Hello, Sonia. Hi, Isabella, great to see you. Thank you for taking your valuable time. And Always nice to today. see you. Always nice to see you. Thank you for inviting me Thank also. You. Pretty sure I got here because of you. <laughs> Students love you. Yes, the feeling is mutual here. So um, I pulled this up. So you should be able to um, have, have the email address. I also put it in the chat. Um, anybody else have other questions? We are still matching employers up to students. 
So you guys, if you're looking for an internship, you can still get one, um, especially if you're in marketing, if you have an interest of that, or if you're in business management, you'll get snagged right away, pretty sure. So you would just go to the website and then you know, click the student supply. A question. Um, so does this process of matching the student with the employer, um, does this have any cost? Oh, no, not to you guys. For the employer, yes. Right now, we're doing a lot of testing. Um, so they are coming in here, and they are my guinea pigs also. So we're testing the matching side of it. They're testing out the courses that are for them. They're testing out the assessments, the development plan. By the end of the internship, you leave with uh, clearly identified skills based on what's on that job description what you'll be able to put on there, the technology, um, the responsibilities that you had. So it's definitely been <laughs> something that I've worked on for a while to get to this place where we are now in a pilot program. We will have um, Orlando Economic Partnerships should be coming on. So that's three counties, Osceola, Orange and Seminole. Florida High Tech Corridor has expressed uh, the STEM Connect program has told me, yes, they're coming in, but I may be getting the whole tech, all 11, 12 regions of the whole state. And then I've had some uh, two meetings with NASA right now. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we have employers that are here in Central Florida, but they're also based in other places of the United States. They're all remote. So you wouldn't have to worry about that. But there's no cost to a school. There's no cost to students. So I have a question. Are any of the companies a uh, nonprofit? Yes, we do have nonprofits. Uh, one of them is the Florida Association of Veteran-Owned Businesses. So if you have an interest in working with veterans, that's there. Another one is uh, one that focuses, it's a new startup that focuses on mental health, mental wellness. Um, really interesting what they're doing. So, you know, there's, and there's more than that, but yeah, we have nonprofit as well as profit. Um, I have a question. I'm currently also um, in the business and organizational leadership program but I, I'm going to graduate on May. Can I still apply for like a summer yeah. or a full internship if I've ever graduated? Yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Uh, I would probably take you under my wing, honestly, because that's where I have, you know, I usually have four roles where HR plugs in. So you could work in a number of capacities, you know, working with either Handshake. We have um, social and team building outreaches that we do. Um, there's a lot of choices. We're going to be developing a study. So if you're more of a researcher, you could work with, I'm not a PhD yet, but the PhD that will be working with me on our study. So there's a lot of um, opportunities. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. So I'll look for your resume, Vanessa. Yes. Yeah. Any, Any other questions? questions? Yeah, I have a question, please. Uh, I have been moved to uh, the Ooh, US you're talking for two really years. soft. You might need to speak up just a little bit more. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. So uh, I have I moved to the US for two years. And uh, to be honest, I am uh, I am more than 40 years old. Um, I got a rich background in back to Asia, not here. Um, uh, I mean, I was uh, I was a GM in in Vietnam, but when I moved here, you know, I had to start everything again. I got a CMA, uh, the Certified Management Accountant by IMA, but I still want to take a certificate program in accounting technology with Valencia because I want to have a job. So in my resume, um, can you help me to advise me if I should put all the working background um, in my resume or I just have to start over everything? Put all of your resume, uh, put it, all of your experience on there. You're moving, you said from Vietnam, right? Yes. 
Yeah. So you want to make sure that all of that, you know, good, good work history that you have and the skills. Are you certified with QuickBooks also by chance? Yes. Um, oh, put that like make, make sure all of your skills are at the top of your resume. That would be a one way to make sure that people are focused on what those skills are. However many years of experience you have, that would be a really good thing. If it's accounts payable, receivable, payroll, those are all good to have. I know that uh, Ms. Casablanca can, I, I know I call her by her first name, but you know, Professor Casablanca, she can also look at your resume and give you some suggestions too as to what you should do. And of course, your career services um, office is always great. Um, you guys, I'm pretty sure know how to get there. Um, but yeah, put all of that experience on there and specifically the skills and quantify whatever you can quantify. If you do, you know, like small business, enterprise, whatever it is that you were doing there. Uh, one more thing, I I don't know how for my education, I got the master degree back to Asia. Should I put it in as well? Because oh, yeah. from from my from my friend, they live here for a long time. They told me that you should not put master degree in there because people will not hire master for entry level job. Entry level here in the United States, that would be true. However, it depends on what you're looking for. So if you're looking to go to a medium to a large size company, I would definitely leave that master's uh, degree on there. But if you're going to a small business, and maybe if you've done taxes, I would definitely leave leave it on there. If you your master's on there, if you've done tax returns as it relates to uh, bookkeeping and accounting, that would be beneficial. But if it is going to be with a small business, they're really going to be more interested in the QuickBooks. I don't I don't think it will hurt that much, but it can be a way that they would think that no, you're overqualified. You've got a master's, so. You would want to have a customized resume for different types of sizes of companies and different opportunities for sure. The masters will make you stand out if it's a big giant company, obviously. The fact that you can speak multiple languages and you've got, you know, yet years of experience is going to make you stand out. If you went to like EY, you know, Ernst and Young with them, any of those types of companies. Thank you so much for You're very welcome. I'm pretty sure well, that Professor Casablanca tells you guys the same things. Pretty sure. Yes, adding or, or just confirming what Isabella just shared. Um, your instructors will be more than willing to check your resume. Also use Valencia um, resources. Savior. The career center, the writing center is so important. Make sure that you have your resume. And even when you think that is great, other people, it's important that other people take a second, a third, a fourth look to make sure that it's a polished resume. So the resources are there free of charge for all of you to just please take advantage of those. And of course, your instructors. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, going back to what Vanessa was saying, does it to submit the application and everything for your program, Isabella, do you have to be a student or can you have graduated? And yeah. yeah, so technically for an unpaid internship, you're supposed to be a student. Um, I'm working on making sure that it covers people that do a volunteer role, because that's where really where when you're out of school. Does it fall under volunteering? Yes, safely. And it still protects the person that's there because I saw that as one of the other needs in the market, to be honest, where, you know, when it's somebody like COVID, you've been laid off or it's uh, somebody like, you know, in this case, Chow, who had mm -hmm. lots of experience, you know, 20 years of experience, or you're trying to transition from, you know, a job to something else. It's gonna be really important to, or you're already out of school like Vanessa, it will be in May then, you know, what is it that you can do? And, you know, it's about making sure that you've got something that's gonna to speak to the groups. Next time I get together, I'm gonna to talk with you guys, like I said, about LinkedIn. It's gonna be really, really important that you network, network, network like crazy, join some LinkedIn groups, attend things that are like uh, meetups 
and also any conferences that are coming up where you can volunteer. When you volunteer on it at a conference, you get to know people on a different level and they go, oh yeah, we've got an opening over here because now you're not an attendee. So you never know how you can get that next opportunity. So this is not the time to be shy is the point. It's the time to be brave and just go, okay, I'm going to meet, you know, 100 people, and out of those 100 people, there might be 10 people that will tell me yes, that they'll talk with me. That's okay. That's okay. So I know as a college student, it's more recommended to do internships, but when it comes to trying to find a career or just a job in general, is it better or will it matter if it's uh, if you have volunteer experience versus internship experience? I think internship experience matters more than volunteer experience, honestly, because usually, usually, you know, people go volunteer. That doesn't sound like it's any type of a real structure behind it. Mm -hmm. So there's this place where when I redo resumes, I go, mm, let's don't put volunteer. Let's put that you're, you're either, um, doing your own thing you're like doing side work so mm -hmm. we can position you that way not necessarily an intern but you're there to do as contractor you know as a contractor but you don't have to disclose you're not being paid there's different ways you can word something on your resume so it would make people look at you that's one of the things that i'll again i'll talk about some more so that title um, people have stayed with me for a little while. They've left that they're still with me on their LinkedIn and their um, their resume. And they'll ask my permission if they can do that. And I'll say, yeah, and I'll give them either a recommendation on LinkedIn or you know a letter if that's what they need. But I can make introductions. And most of the people get hired relatively quickly within the three months after they graduate. Some of them not, and it's for different reasons. It's not because, it's because they didn't want to do their degree, honestly, or they've made some other life change, something significant. All right. Like I had graphic designers that decided they didn't want to do graphic design. One went and sold Mary Kay makeup, nothing wrong with that, but it's just what she wanted to do. And then the other one decided to go into retail because you know they wanted something that was different and they used their skills in a different way there. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any more questions? Well, you I guys know how to get in touch with me. Oh, I'm sorry, Ronald. I, I was saying I wanted to try the game. I put my oh, email Oh, okay. On. Well, what I need you to do is email me with, okay, first off, we can't play it on a Mac yet. We're getting a program so you can play it in a Mac. Do you have a PC? Yes. Okay, perfect. So send me an email and put in the subject line that you'd like uh, two game keys and you'll be able to play it. We've got two levels in there. It's Mars and Venus. Uh, sorry, Mars and Neptune. And end of this month, we're releasing, you know, all four of our characters. They've been upgraded. We've got our headquarters. We've got our story laid out and we have Venus that's going up there. We're trying to get the moon done, but there's going to be a lot of things that are going up there on the next level. So yeah, tell yeah. me you want two game keys and I will give you two. Thanks. And give us a review. It doesn't have to be, it, it needs to be honest, an honest review. Okay. Don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what's wrong with it, but tell me how to fix it. Or if you love what? it, tell me that you loved it. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you for coming out and I look forward to our next meeting, Isabella. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. You guys were really great. You came in with really good questions. I'm glad to see that you were interacting on the chat also, and uh, I'll be asking you more questions next time we get together. All right, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye, Isabella, thank you. You're